everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Neal, uh, welcoming uh, you all back uh, to our, uh, our event, our virtual symposium, um, focused on uh, strengthening the housing ecosystem um, to boost Black and Hispanic home ownership um, with a specific uh, kind of template of, of the data, the trends, the experiences um, in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and, you know, let me start off uh, first um, by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Michael Neal. I'm a principal research associate um, here at the Urban Institute. Uh, second, let me say that, uh, you know, we wrapped up the first half of this event um, largely focused on uh, the government. Uh, the, the policy steps that the government has taken um, to address the long-standing challenges, um, as well as uh, the short-term challenges in response to uh, to to the COVID crisis. Um, we heard uh, from our lo from local officials um, about uh, steps being taken uh, who who focused on the execution, not just in terms of demand, uh, in terms of things like down payment assistance, um, but also uh, in terms of affordable supply. Um, we heard a lot about land trusts, um, not just in terms of achieving home ownership, um, but also in terms of benefiting from home ownership. Um, and we heard from a from a diverse number of officials across different cities um, in a way that hopefully will allow one um, to put them together into a fairly robust uh, toolkit. That was the first half. Um, now the second half, uh, we're focused on, again, thinking about the idea of the ecosystem on non-governmental actors. Um, so we'll, folk, we'll first start uh, with, uh, with a discussion among researchers uh, in terms of how do we size, how do we identify, um, and how do we provide precision and accuracy um, around solutions. Um, and then we'll move to our final panel in which we'll talk about other non-research and non-governmental actors, uh, uh, community, com community advocates advocates, state level uh, stakeholders, uh, mortgage lenders, uh, private investors, um, all of them play a role uh, in terms of responding to the, to, to the actions and the policies of the government, but they also have their own uh, incentives, um, which, uh, which, which, which lead to the final result in terms of Black and Hispanic home ownership. Um, so with that introduction, um, we're going to start uh, with our third panel, um, and I'm going to first uh, introduce uh, the uh, both the the uh, my my partner uh, on, on this panel, um, as well as our moderator, um, and then I'll start uh, with kind of a, re a research presentation in terms of the data and the trends, um, a part of the data and trends that we're seeing um, here at the Urban Institute. <clears throat> So as I said, my name is Michael Neal. Uh, I am a principal research assist associate uh, at, uh, here at the Urban Institute uh, uh, in the Housing Finance Policy Center, um, where we focus on issues of mortgage finance, uh, issues of racial equity, um, as well as issues of, of housing supply. Um, but I'm joined uh, on the panel uh, by uh, uh, Professor uh, David Trout, um, who is a distinguished professor of law and justice um, and the John J. Francis Scholar at Rutgers uh, Law School uh, in Newark, where he also directs uh, what we call CLIMB, or the Center on Law, Inequality, and, Metropoli uh, and Metropolitan Equity. Um, his, mo he, his most recent book, uh, The Price of Paradise, The Cost of Inequality and a Vision of a More Equitable America um, was published by uh, NYU Press. I mean, so I certainly urge you, um, if you have an opportunity to go and uh, get and read that book. Um, our panel will be moderated uh, by uh, Laura Sullivan, uh, who is a director of economic justice at the New Jersey Institute of Social, of Social Justice, um, where she is an experienced policy researcher specializing um, in analyzing the long-term financial well-being and vulnerabilities of households, um, with a particular focus on assets uh, and racial wealth. Uh, uh, in addition, Dr. Sullivan um, uh, ha has exposed the trends and drivers of the racial wealth gap um, and has been covered by major media outlets uh, around the country. Um, so welcome uh, to all of them, um, and I am going to turn uh, to my uh, to my presentation, um, just you know, using research as a way of of contributing uh, to, uh, to 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 the efforts of boosting uh, Black and Hispanic home ownership. <clears throat> um, so if you uh, if you can turn uh, to 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 the, to the next page. Uh, one of the things that I want to start off with is just laying the foundation. Um, my, my presentation is largely going to compare and contrast uh, some of the data trends 
that we've seen across uh, the city of Newark um, with some of the stylized facts um, that we know uh, from, the nat from, from, from our understanding of national data. Um, and the first one is illustrated here on this slide. Uh, we know, you know, the, the uh, nationwide, we know that, uh, that, 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 white, uh, that whites uh, represent uh, the majority of the population. Um, and in fact, uh, as you can see here, uh, they represent about 74% of, of, the, of the population nationwide. Um, and that's a key reason why, uh, why, whites, why white households um, represent the majority of homeowners. Um, but you, know, you can see in that top table that you know, in contrast, uh, the, majority, you know, the, the majority of the population in Newark um, is black or Hispanic, um, accounting for roughly about 85% of the population. Um, in contrast, you know, the white population um, is roughly around 12% um, as of 2019. Um, moving down uh, to uh, moving down to the uh, to 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 the bottom slide, um, you know, again, what we can what what we can see here uh, is in fact that uh, a wide gap in home ownership. You can see that across the the bottom uh, the bottom row there that the white home ownership rate um, is seventy two percent, while fewer than half of Black and Hispanic households um, are homeowners nationwide. Uh, that's forty two percent and four. 48% respectively. Um, and so that gives rise to this very kind of wide, uh, wide home ownership rate gap um, across race and ethnicity. This is something that, you know, we that was touched on um, kind of at the beginning uh, of this of this event. Um, but, you know, in contrast, uh, what you can see if you, again, staying with the bottom table uh, and the second row there, uh, that the, the third row, that the story is a little bit different. Um, across the city, namely that uh, you know fewer twenty overall twenty four percent of households are considered homeowners, and that rate is relatively low um, across uh, all households by race and ethnicity. Um, suggests indicating uh, that these these this racial uh, home ownership rate gap across the city is significant is significantly smaller um, relative uh, to uh, relative um, to what we observe nationwide. Um, and so this is, I think, a key a key part of the discussion in terms of, you know, what then, you know, the degree to which we talk about racial gaps and homeowner uh, racial uh, challenges in home ownership as being founded or based on these gaps, these wide gaps in home ownership. But we don't necessarily, while we observe that nationwide, and that's where this idea comes from, we don't necessarily observe this across uh, the city of Newark. And so it gives rise to, I think, a deeper conversation and one that we heard. Uh, from our key government uh, uh, officials uh, um, that uh, of, of then what then is and how do we then solve um, the racial uh, the racial uh, the racial disparities um, that we uh, that 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 we know uh, that we know take place. Um, if you turn to the next slide, uh, just continuing on that theme, uh, you know, again, you know, what we see is that uh, incomes uh, across the city uh, are generally lower. Uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, than, than they are nationwide. Um, so on the left-hand side, uh, we're just showing uh, median household income. Um, we break it out by what we call tenure. So we break it out by renter households uh, versus homeowner households. Um, and on the right-hand side of that chart, uh, of that same chart, uh, we have uh, the nationwide numbers. And what you can see is that, you know, for any type, you know, both overall and for uh, each type of tenure, renter versus homeowner, um, median incomes or the typical uh, household's income um, is high higher nationwide uh, than it is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, than it is uh, across the city. Um, and in fact, uh, what you can also see is that the median homeowner income in the city is roughly on par with uh, uh, with the median home, with the median income overall uh, across across the U.S. Uh, as the uh, uh, across the U.S. as a whole. I'm just giving additional uh, 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 data and additional comparison um, to illustrate uh, the role that uh, that that income, uh, the differences in income between the city of Newark and the nation as a whole, and then thinking about that um, as both a challenge as well um, as an opportunity. Um, but at the same time, if you turn to the right hand side table, um, what we what we have, what we are trying to illustrate here is 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 our challenges with supply, um, particularly around construction. 
Um, so what we're doing is we are we are taking the share of homes built uh, over the last 20 or so years um, relative to the total uh, relative to the total housing stock, and we're comparing that both in Newark um, as well as in the United States. Um, and then we're looking at it uh, in terms in across different types of products. So we look at it overall, um, but we also look at it across single family homes, uh, multifamily homes, uh, owner occupied homes uh, versus renter occupied homes. And so, and what we observe uh, here is, <clears throat> excuse me, what we observe here is that uh, this first evidence that uh, the pace of construction across the city, at least over the last 20 years, um, has been lower uh, relative to the underlying housing stock um, in comparison to what we see uh, nationwide. Um, most notably, what you'll see is that owner and the owner occupied uh, column that 11% of the of the homes that exist uh, across the city um, of the owner occupied homes across the city um, have been built uh, over the last 20 years. Um, in comparison, uh, about the, the average, the, the percentage, the share is double that uh, nationwide. Again, suggesting that while we know um, that these supply challenges exist in areas around the country, they appear to be particularly acute uh, in, this, in, in the city of Newark. Um, and the next slide, I think, illustrates, you know, some of the, some of the, uh, so, you know, some of, some of the, uh, so, some of the repercussions of that. Um, but also, I think, gives deeper insight when we take a bit of a longer view. Um, so naturally, all else equal, a lack of supply, we would certainly expect to see a uh, uh, faster, uh, faster house price appreciation, which would have implications both for affordability as well as uh, housing equity. Um, and but the left, oops, on the next, on the next slide. Um, uh, but what you'll see um, here uh, is that uh, while certainly um, there is evidence uh, that house price uh, that house price appreciation um, over uh, uh, it, house price appreciation has uh, uh, eclipsed uh, that of the nation as a whole. You can see that on the right hand chart where the five year house price change in order to get rid of you know year to year volatility the five year house price change uh, across the city of Newark um, exceeds uh, the nationwide average. That blue line is above uh, the yellow line. Um, and is in fact uh, roughly around um, 50%. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you can see uh, is that uh, house prices in Newark are actually much more volatile. Um, that is, uh, in good times, uh, house prices tend to outperform uh, uh, the nation. Um, where, but then in bad times, um, they appear to, they can appear, uh, especially during the Great Recession, they can appear to significantly underperform. Um, and so that brings us kind of over to the to the chart on the left hand side, um, which indicates that certainly while we've seen very strong um, house price appreciation across the city of Newark, um, and in fact, stronger appreciation um, across the city than across the nation as a whole. If we go back over time, we can see that house prices, according to our data, are just now about getting back to where they were during the housing boom years. Um, that is a, that where we are on the left hand chart where that blue line is currently um, is roughly at slightly below its peak uh, in 2006 2007. Um, in contrast, when we look at that yellow line, again, we're looking at the left-hand side chart, that yellow line where it is currently um, is significantly above uh, its peak um, uh, during, the period of the during the period of the housing boom. Um, so that's going to have important implications. Uh, you know, if you turn to the next slide, uh, what, we, what we see um, is, uh, is that uh, homeowners, uh, uh, ho on average, across the city of Newark, homeowners have less housing equity. Um, that you can see that that blue line um, is systematically uh, below uh, the black line, um, which captures average housing equity across, uh, across the U.S., um, since uh, 2009, which is as far back as we can go uh, with this data set. Um, and similarly, or conversely, depending on how you're thinking about it, um, there is a larger proportion of homeowners in Newark that also have uh, negative equity um, as well. Um, so this, you know, the, 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 the faster, certainly a lack of supply contributes to higher house prices. Um, but at the same time, a longer term view uh, indicates uh, a degree of volatility such that there are still a number of homeowners um, that remain uh, in, 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 precarious, in, in a precarious situation. 
Um, and so that dovetails with some of the data that uh, will that you'll see on the on the next slide, which is um, that not only uh, do we observe uh, evidence of instability with respect to house prices, um, but we also observe a greater instability um, with respect to unemployment as well, um, both systematically over time, as well as over business cycles. Um, so what I mean by that is when you look at the left-hand side, uh, you see that the unemployment rate uh, across the city of Newark is systematically greater than the nation as a whole. Um, to a degree that may reflect uh, if, uh, issues around racial discrimination and racial disparities that we know um, affect Black and Hispanic workers relative to white workers. Um, but at the same time, what you, what you can also see during the pandemic recession um, is that that blue line actually rose uh, 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 higher um, than, what we, than, than, the, than the unemployment rate uh, nationwide, suggesting that to a degree during periods of crisis, labor market conditions can actually grow worse at a faster speed. And so what does that mean? The right-hand side kind of puts that together, which is the degree to which you see, to the degree to which there's a larger proportion of, of homeowners uh, that, uh, that may be uh, 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 underwater or having negative equity or a smaller proportion with positive equity, um, at the same time, uh, a, a higher likelihood of losing your job or not having a job, uh, those are two key de uh, determinants of mortgage delinquency um, and help in part to explain uh, some of the trends that we see uh, on the right-hand chart. Um, that is that uh, what we call 90 plus day mortgage delinquency. That is that you've missed, your, you, you've missed three or more payments uh, on your mortgage. Um, that, 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 that uh, percentage or that ratio um, is higher um, across the city of Newark um, than it is uh, in the, uh, across the nation as a whole. Um, and in fact, uh, our, by our estimates, uh, the 90 plus day mortgage delinquency rate uh, rose to somewhere around 30% uh, in the wake of the Great Recession and the financial crisis. Um, at the same time, uh, we also saw a, 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 a run up in mortgage delinquency uh, during the COVID uh, recession um, as well. Um, and while we have seen a bit of a recovery uh, in recent months, um, again, that gap, uh, prevail, that, that gap persists. Um, and so what the point of all of this is really to, to bring your mind to um, this idea that, uh, that part of the, part of the, 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 the challenge in Newark um, is, is, is systematic in nature. That is that it happens over time. There are these persistent gaps um, in the experience of Newark relative to the experience of the nation as a whole. Um, but at the same time, uh, amid a crisis like the COVID recession, uh, the home ownership situation can get, uh, can get, can actually get worse Worse uh, across the city, uh, even relative to what's been reported and what's been shown across the United States. Um, that being said, though, uh, the next slide indicates, I think, a key uh, a key uh, benefit of public policy, um, particularly uh, related to things like uh, the stimulus uh, payments, uh, the foreclosure uh, foreclosure moratorium on, on agency loans, um, uh, forbearance, um, homeowner assistance fund, um, and, a, and a swath of other policies taken both at uh, the national level as well as at uh, the state and local level, um, and that is is a uh, uh, continued uh, continued uh, decline in uh, foreclosure for in, in the rate of foreclosure. Um, that is, even though uh, homeowners, uh, particularly across the city of Newark, but also nationwide, um, experienced uh, a cri you know a crisis in response to the pandemic uh, recession, which resulted in a greater uh, likelihood of being delinquent. Uh, the, the, per, there, was no, there was no evidence in the data um, that, uh, of an increase in the likelihood of these homeowners actually losing their home uh, to foreclosure. Um, and so I think to a degree um, that can be interpreted um, as a key, uh, as a key uh, uh, success um, of public policy. Um, although I think we also need to be uh, aware and cognizant of you know, the underlying dynamics that supported, uh, that, that gave rise to the success, as well as other places um, where, those, where the cost um, of delinquency may have actually been uh, absorbed. Um, but that being, 
All of that being said, uh, the, the, the final key point here is even though foreclosure rates have not really risen in response to the COVID recession, um, either across the city of Newark or nationwide, um, yet and still the foreclosure rate across the city remains higher um, than, uh, than the nation as a whole. Again, uh, suggesting the uh, indicating these longer run persistent disparities um, that may be rooted um, in uh, racial disparities as well as the vulnerabilities uh, associated with uh, lower income households. Um, and then finally, in terms of data, um, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, in terms of data, um, while it's certainly, the, there's certainly evidence uh, that uh, the recent run-up of house prices um, combined with lower incomes, uh, excuse me, turning the, on the next slide, um, what the recent run-up in house prices uh, combined with lower incomes um, certainly uh, suggest uh, uh, concerns um, around, uh, uh, around affordability. Um, and while at the same time, the run-up in house prices does suggest that, uh, does indicate improvements uh, in the equity position, um, even if it's not uh, to the, not at the same level um, as the nation as a whole, um, we still observe um, some challenges uh, with respect to the benefits uh, of home ownership across the city. And so part of that is illustrated here. Um, the first part, the, if you look on the left-hand side, um, what you see uh, is a uh, the typical uh, uh, homeowner uh, cost faced by uh, a Newark resident um, relative to the nation as a whole, and that's roughly in 2019 we estimated that to to be about 600 um, 600 uh, uh, dollars higher uh, across the city um, across homeowners living in the city of Newark. Um, but at the same time, keep in mind that homeowners across the city also have lower incomes uh, on average as well. Um, and so what that means, uh, what, that, what, that, uh, what that combines to mean um, is that while the typical homeowner um, it, it nationwide uh, is not what we call cost burden, um, that is that uh, their homeowner costs um, are less, are, are greater than or equal to 30% of their income within the city, the typical homeowner actually is cost burdened. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's a key contrast, um, both, uh, in terms of, both in terms of experience, but also in terms of what we talk about when we say the benefits of home ownership. At the national level, you know, we like to talk about, you know, the, the benefits of home ownership are that, you know, hopefully you can refinance your mortgage when interest rates are low. This helps to reduce uh, your, this helps to reduce uh, your mortgage payment and ultimately your homeowner costs um, and, 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 your, and your homeowner burden uh, more generally. Um, and that's captured, if you look at the table on the left-hand side and that in the lowest chart there, that's captured by the fact that the share of renters uh, that are cost burden, about 49% percent of renters are cost burdened, while 21 percent of homeowners are cost burdened. Um, but when we look at the line just above it, what we see is that uh, more than half of that, that may not necessarily hold true um, across the city of Newark. Um, in fact, uh, the majority of renters and homeowners are considered cost burdened. Um, part of that, again, may be rooted in research that suggests that Black and Hispanic homeowners are less able to refi, particularly uh, in times of crisis. Um, but it may also be rooted uh, in this interaction of, of other costs that homeowners have to pay, combined with uh, the, at the, the systematic, uh, systematically lower incomes of Newark homeowners relative to homeowners uh, nationwide. I mean, that's given by the table on the right-hand side. I'm just going to draw your attention uh, to the final two columns um, where we're looking at real estate taxes paid um, as a share of home values and then as a share of homeowner household income. Um, and you can see that uh, they are, they are uh, 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 higher uh, within the city uh, relative uh, to the United States overall. Again, part of that has to do with, uh, you know, real estate taxes being paid, um, but part of that has to do, uh, as you can intuit in the final column, uh, of, the, of lower incomes uh, of Newark homeowners as well. Um, and to a degree, you know, you know, we want to take this with a grain of salt in the sense that real estate taxes pay um, for important local uh, services uh, as well. I mean, so it's really important, I think, not to necessarily interpret this um, as a negative result per, uh, overall, but to really think about, you know, what are the trade-offs or what are, you know, what are you paying relative to what are you, what, you know, what one is, uh, is receiving. And it oftentimes, that's very much a, a personal uh, decision. 
Um, and so all that to say uh, that uh, the, all that to say that uh, the challenge of home ownership, both getting into home ownership um, as well as benefiting from home ownership, appears to be systematically more difficult in the city of Newark relative to the nation as a whole. Um, and that that uh, that experience can actually be can, can actually worsen um, in response uh, to uh, a crisis like the COVID recession. Um, that being said, though, uh, I want to just I, 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 I want to point out on the next slide uh, that this research can also how this research can help public policy. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the on federal policy um, uh, with an example uh, uh, taken from uh, from uh, from the housing assistance fund. Um, as you can see on this chart, uh, the housing assistance fund was uh, the homeowner assistance fund, excuse me, was established under the American Rescue Plan Act um, and was designed to prevent mortgage delinquencies, uh, defaults, um, foreclosures, uh, uh, loss of utilities and, and energy services, um, as well as uh, displacement uh, of homeowners. Um, and the third, uh, the, the third uh, 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 a bullet there, I think, indicates that it not that that it prioritized uh, historically vulnerable households, lower income households, uh, homeowners of color, um, exactly kind of the the homeowners um, that the data suggests um, are disproportionately represented in the city of Newark relative to uh, the nation as a whole. Um, and so it in, it suggests that uh, that the homeowner assistance fund um, is was one key policy um, designed uh, and really. Uh, um, uh, help to help uh, uh, homeowners in uh, a city and with the type of experiences um, that the data suggests were taking place uh, across the city of Newark. Um, and more specifically, as we know, the Homeowner Assistance Fund provided money to the state, to, to each of the states, um, as well as Washington, D.C. and other, uh, and other territories. Um, and then the states then designed programs uh, that, were, that would be able to uh, much more precisely target the challenges uh, in areas um, across their jurisdiction. Um, and so the final slide kind of walks through, uh, you know, the, the, the Homeowner Assistance Fund um, uh, as uh, it's been developed uh, across the state of New Jersey. I mean, what you can see across uh, in the next slide um, is that uh, is that uh, is that the New Jersey Homeowner Assistance Fund, um, what they term the Emergency Rescue Mortgage Assistance, uh, provided thirty five thousand um, dollars for household ex uh, uh, expenses, um, which include you know mortgage reinstatement. That's you know starting becoming uh, the uh, repaying your mortgage um, and becoming current on your mortgage again. Um, you know. Uh, shortages um, in escrow, delinquent property taxes, which you know is a maybe a particular challenge uh, across the state of New Jersey, um, as well as you know municipal you know municipal and property tax liens. Um, uh, and to qualify, uh, you know a, a homeowner a homeowner must own and occupy you know a first an eligible one to four unit primary residence, um, as well as have experienced uh, a COVID nineteen uh, related financial hardship. I mean, as we saw in the data, uh, while the 90-day mortgage delinquency rate rose nationwide, um, it, per, it rose uh, even more so um, across the city of Newark. And while we have seen a, 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 a recovery uh, in recent months, um, uh, the 90-day delinquency rate as well as the foreclosure rate um, do remain uh, systematically higher across the city uh, relative to the state, uh, relative, excuse me, relative to the country as a whole. And so really I see kind of a lot of uh, uh, the design of the homeowner assistance fund, um, both nationwide as well uh, as in the city as one key example of how data can be brought uh, to uh, um, to the challenge of Black and Hispanic home ownership um, and, and ultimately be used uh, to design policies that are particularly targeted um, to those who appear to be uh, systematically uh, more vulnerable uh, than, uh, than the average household nationwide. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the next slide just provides some of my contact information, but I'm going to turn it over to my, uh, to my colleague, uh, uh, David Trout, to walk through uh, uh, some of his key um, research findings. David. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it never fails to happen like this, but um, whenever your neighbor is cutting down trees, they will begin mulching those trees when it's your time to speak. So I'm going to apologize in advance for that dreadful sound of trees being mulched. Um, Michael said a lot of, um, or at least amplified a lot of the points that I would make. Um, but um, the, the point of, of the information I'm about to share is really to draw upon 
one of my favorite quotes, the many great quotes from Newark's mayor, Ras Baraka, who has always uh, talked about aspiring to gentrify the city from within. Gentrification from within is his phrase. And it seems to me that there's really no better um, sort of ecosystemic aspiration for a, a, a low to moderate income city than that. Because what it suggests is that um, a, a wealth creation, the expansion of economic opportunity, um, the possibility for greater mobility that has been the history uh, for so many of the, of the city's residents will change if we rely upon the, the, the current residents and, to, and help to build opportunities for economic um, um, uh, mobility from within as opposed to from without. And that's very much the tension going on in this e ecosystemic hope for greater black and Hispanic uh, home ownership in a city like Newark, which is after all experiencing tremendous growth. So what I wanna talk about are, are sort of two sides of the, of the constraints as revealed by two projects that my center at Rutgers Law School climbed, the Center on Law, Inequality and Metropolitan Equity has been looking at. So, so just to give you a, a, an overview of, of the remarks, there's a sort of a, a, there are two broad themes. There's a demand side and a supply side. And on the demand side, what we see is just tremendous housing insecurity. And if this is the population from which gentrification will come, if this is the population that we are hoping will become homeowner ready and become homeowners, you know, through whatever proliferation of programs and creative ideas we have, the data so far, very much as, as, as Michael's presentation just demonstrated, are not particularly courage, encouraging. So let's, let's begin, I just have a few slides, let's begin the slideshow with, um, with a look at renters. So in February of 2021, next slide please, we produced a report called Homes Beyond Reach, which was an analysis of the affordability gap in the city of Newark. And we, we produced this report in order to aid the conversation around affordability initiatives um, by the city itself, um, and also to support some of the work of the Equitable Growth Advisory Commission on which I sit. And we really just had not seen a kind of a detailed use of research up until that point to, to flesh out the dimensions of the affordability gap for a city of renters. And as you know, Newark is a city of renters. 80% of its population, roughly, just a little bit less than that, are renters. And they're low income renters for the most part. The median renter uh, income for the city, at least in 2018, uh, 2019, from which the, the, the data was drawn for the report, it's about $30,000. That's, as you know, significantly low and very difficult from a renting standpoint, let alone from a homeowner standpoint. So there's tremendous need. And you see in this particular chart taken from, from the report um, that um, on the left, the, 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 the households making $30,000 or left are the substantial majority of those. There's, you know, there's the 30 to 40,000 range but then if you look at the right, the availability of units that corresponds with that renter capacity, that income capacity is, um, you know, shows tremendous deficits. There's just the reverse if you're making over 60,000, which uh, uh, strangely enough, of course, would qualify as affordable housing under AMI for this very expensive region we're in. But you see there, there there's, there's, there's almost abundant housing at more than 1,500. Um, most housing is between 1,000 and 1,500, but very little at what is truly affordable um, if we're using the 30% the, the of income um, 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 variable, right? So, so what it tells us is that, um, as Michael pointed out, almost two thirds, 59% of Newark's renter households, which represent most of its households, are rent burdened, are, 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 are rent burdened, and about a third of them are extremely rent burdened, paying 50% or more of their household income on housing costs. 
On the legal side, we see all these implications in terms of displacement risk through evictions, and the city has done a lot to try to um, try to head some of that off through the creation of the Office of Tenant Legal Services and to provide um, free counsel to indigent, uh, indigent tenants facing eviction. But nevertheless, this is the state of precarity for so many of Newark's residents. Uh, next slide, please. So we estimate that the actual affordability gap for the city is over 16,000 units. In other words, more than 16,000 units would need to be produced at a local median affordability rent of $763, which is almost a Herculean task to imagine, but it does give you some, some sense of the scale of the problem. Of course, the scale of the problem becomes worse if you're a, a, a family um, with multiple members crossing generations because the, the inventory of larger apartments of more than two bedrooms is particularly sparse. And so we estimate that there's a need for almost, out of that 16,000 plus units, there's a need for almost 6,000 units that are three families or more. We produced this report in, in the middle of the pandemic, but as you know, um, the, the need to be able to stay in place and the problem of overcrowding had direct public health consequences for the population who simply could not satisfy those public health warnings because of housing constraints. Um, so, so that's the LMAR the, 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 and, 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 and the affordability gap that comes from it. The LMAR being the, the, the local median affordable rent of 763 and the gap um, of 16,000. Um, let's see, is my next slide, my next slide I think may move on to the next problem. Well, yeah, so let me, let me hold off on that slide for just a moment and just conclude then that, that with respect to the constraints on demand, um, the low home ownership rates that Michael um, showed on his slide, I think he showed 24%, really reflect this, this, the kind of limited demand that's a consequence of households that uh, really have structurally and, um, and, and, and for too long um, um, a consistent and persistent, a persistently limited resources. And this reflects all sorts of, uh, of labor force issues, transportation issues, and the whole panoply of things that we see in so many legacy cities. But nevertheless, this is the base reality. And this base reality got worse over the pandemic. Now I'd like to move on to the supply side, if we could look at the next slide. So against this demand side problem of trying to, to assist the residents, the majority of residents in the city to become homeowner ready, to, to enter an, into an ecosystem in which home ownership is possible, are some very significant supply side problems that many of you have, have heard about we heard about in the last few months and are currently studying, and that is the problem of corporate buying. And the, the problem of corporate buying has, has really been revealed to many of us through a couple of studies conducted over the last six months. Um, Redfin and the Washington Post both published studies back in February, which showed that in many cities across the South and in the Rust Belt, they're seeing corporate ownership of residential properties at an astonishing rate of something like 20%. It is significantly worse than that in the city of Newark. And so what you see in this first slide is it uh, uh, corresponds to some of the chronological, the historical processes that Michael talked about arising from the Great Recession. So this is a trend. Institutional buyers are in the foreground in, in the black. Other buyers are in the, in the background in the gray. And what you see along the timeline on the bottom axis, axis is that um, in 2013, just as the foreclosure crisis is reaching a peak in the city of Newark, you begin to see the steady increase in corporate purchases of what were traditionally homes inhabited either by single families or by owner occupied uh, uh, landlord, say one to four unit homes. And that's really the big difference here, right? These are homes that investors 
who have always been landlords, have always um, um, uh, satisfied the needs of renters in cities across the country, used to shy from. They used to focus on multifamily homes, multifamily buildings, not so much down at the one to four unit level. Here we're seeing a dramatic shift. We're seeing the same shift in many of those other cities, but here it is in Newark taking off. And that takeoff is dramatic. We um, have, have documented uh, so far that um, in, from in, in 20, between 2017 and 2020, almost half of all residential sales in the city of Newark have gone to institutional buyers of some sort, mostly LLCs. Think about that. It renders neighborhoods, company towns, to some extent, when you see this proliferation of corporate buyers buying up the housing stock that used to be the basis for so much homeowner wealth for ordinary families. The, um, the buying is occurring primarily in two wards. If I can see the next slide, please. You see um, that, that there's a predominance of corporate purchases in the South Ward and the West Ward. These are predominantly Black wards. And you know the city is predominantly Black and Latino. And so that distribution pretty much holds true throughout a phenomenon that really does reach across the wards, but it is most pronounced in the West Ward where you see here uh, 1,912 properties purchased during this period 2017 to 2020 and um, almost 2,000 properties sold in, in, to in institutional buyers in the South Ward uh, during that same period. Um, next slide, please. And here is uh, a representation of the, the geographic distribution of this trend across the city. It's another way of depicting what you saw in the last pie chart. Uh, where the bigger the circle, the greater the number of purchases. And so you see what had been in areas like Valesburg and Bequake, um, areas of where there was a real possibility as well as a tradition of black homeowner wealth through, um, through, through home ownership passed down through generations. Much of that was lost during the foreclosure process, the, the, the foreclosure crisis, I should say. And it was really at that point that we see um, so many corporate buyers begin to move into, into Newark. But this was the beachhead in which one would have expected the expansion of an ecosystem of black and Hispanic buyers of, of, of home ownership. And it's in these very neighborhoods where you're seeing just the opposite, where you're seeing the encouragement of a kind of a renter economy where there had at one time prior to the foreclosure crisis, been much steadier, much, much more stable home ownership trends, particularly among a black middle and lower middle class population. The last thing that I would mention about this trend is that um, we're seeing a real concentration and sophistication among the buyers themselves. It's been difficult to unearth exactly who all the buyers are. And frankly, it's been difficult to figure out who all the sellers are. Um, beyond the share of sales. But we have noted that there are three to four major players who uh, together um, have bought about 25% of all of these residential purchases in the South and the West Ward. There's another group and then there's um, a, 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 an anonymous investor that has spent tens of millions of dollars in, investing in residential uh, properties in the North Ward as well. And one of the characteristics of the transactions is their complexity as well as their lack of transparency. So using New Jersey County uh, assessor uh, data for the most part, it's been very difficult to figure out exactly who owns what, because in fact, you have many more transactions than you have actual parcels. So the parcels are sold and then they're resold multiple times. And what appears to be the case is the use of holding companies uh, selling to LLCs named after the property in um, a, a, a just a blitz of transactions, sometimes occurring the same day, often in bunches, sometimes a day or two later, sometimes for a dollar in consideration or $10 or zero dollars. And it all seems designed 
to, um, to protect the identities of the owners. So this is a characteristic of buying, of corporate buying in Newark neighborhoods that is troubling um, because they're obviously of, of, of the concern that, that not only are you eating away at, at, a, at the supply of homes that really would form the basis of an ecosystem of black and Hispanic home ownership, but also that you're doing it in a way that sort of assures the secrecy of rent seeking and, um, and therefore a, a lack of accountability. And perhaps I could go so far as to say even a, a lack of, 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 of community participation in the way that we would expect to see in strong neighborhoods. And which has of course been a hallmark of suburban middle-class neighborhoods where a sense of stakeholdership and identity is part and parcel to a sense of home ownership and citizenship. So um, I'll probably leave it there, um, except to say that, um, you know, these are real challenges for us because there's not a lot that can be done to stop corporate buying of so much residential property in cities like Newark. It's constitutionally protected behavior, obviously. Um, but at the same time, as much as one can justify the status quo on a purely capitalist basis, there is, is really no getting around the fact that if the goal is stronger neighborhoods and the wealth accumulation of Newarkers, the current Newarkers, not new Newarkers who will come in and, 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 and buy eventually from these investors, then it's really important to devise creative ways at the public policy level and with the private sector to ensure that, um, that, that folks are not priced out at a, on a rental basis or as homeowners. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for that presentation and Michael to you for your presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. We'll take about 10 minutes um, to just uh, ask a few questions about your presentations and how we can ensure um, that we can through policy and through research, expand home ownership for black and brown families uh, in Newark. So before I get into uh, our discussion a little bit, I just wanted to highlight a few points um, from our research at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice that I think puts Newark into context in the broader state of New Jersey. So just really quickly, three points I wanted to make. Uh, New Jersey is uh, one of the most unequal states in terms of wealth, as Mayor Baraka noted. Uh, we have about um, a $300,000 racial wealth gap, as our recent analysis showed, um, which is about almost twice that of the national racial wealth gap, so which is about $160,000. So we're looking at a more unequal state in terms of wealth. We're also looking at a more unequal state in terms of uh, home ownership, where our home ownership rate, rate disparities are also higher. In addition, New Jersey was the top state in terms of foreclosures uh, for five years running until we hit the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, even uh, with some of the protections uh, that we've seen and the important help that Michael mentioned, uh, New Jersey is again at the top of the list uh, in foreclosures in terms of um, foreclosures in the state since uh, the moratoriums have ended. Um, so putting that unequal uh, state context into play, um, I wanted to ask our our panelists, a few quick questions uh, before we turn to the next panel. So first, um, I think I'll start with, with really what, what we um, intended to do with this panel, which is to bring these important research concepts that our two panelists um, gave to us, the important research context um, that we got from the presentations and talk about how we bring that research into policy and into action. Um, so I'll, first I'll start with Michael. Uh, and then I'll, uh, we'll pass it to David. If you could talk a little bit about um, any challenges or successes uh, you've seen, personally experienced or seen um, in terms of bringing research and then translating that into policy action. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll be brief here. Um, you know, uh, in, terms of, in terms of challenges, uh, you know, I, I, I think a, a couple of things. Um, number one, there's always a challenge around data. Um, you know, I'm encouraged by, uh, by, by David's work on investor properties, because I think it, it, it aptly shows, you know, what we can do with data, but then the limits in terms of how far we can go um, around, you know, who the identity of these people are. Um, but then that in and of itself, um, that, that kind of black box 
um, being 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 really problematic. Um, the second thing uh, that I'll say um, is uh, is around um, interpretation of data. Um, you know, I think that's something uh, that uh, we see kind of when research hits politics, um, and most notably, you're seeing this with uh, the Federal Reserve um, in terms in terms of what what they thought you know infl inflation was. Inflation was supposedly transitory, um, and then it turns out that it, that that it's not um, as they dug deeper and and came to that conclusion. I mean, so those are the types of challenges, and, and ultimately. Um, it hits it hits on credibility, um, and, and that and I feel as researchers, um, again, you know, uh, is why it's so important to 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 be to be objective and faithful to the data that we're look that that we see, um, in order to maintain that kind of credibility that will allow us um, to to influence policy. You know, it, it, no matter who is you know no matter who is in charge. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree. I you know um, we 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 do the research really in aid of policymaking and advocacy. I mean, we're a law school uh, research center and so much litigation, so much policymaking through legal advocacy has to begin from a strong empirical basis. I mean, you really need to understand the scope of the problems before you can really seriously uh, go out and advocate any particular set of, of solutions. Um, you know, we've had some success by helping to articulate the size and the scope of the affordability crisis. I mean, we've been fortunate to be able to work with the city of Newark um, in a number of different ways. And the city has been very receptive to, to the data on affordability and then trying to come up with creative policy solutions to a really enormous problem long in the making. And now we add to it this problem which is difficult because it's full of contradictions, right? On, on the one hand, you want to boost home ownership. On the other hand, you want to boost investment. You are clearly getting corporate investment. And there's probably some relationship between the corporate investment that you're seeing downtown and the corporate investment that you're now seeing or, or, or that, you, that, that is now being revealed to have been occurring in the neighborhoods. I'm not sure everybody knew that, that, that this much was going on because it's certainly not as obvious to the naked eye as new buildings going up and downtown. So, so it's a challenge then to figure out not only how to get over that contradiction, but then to figure out what does it mean in terms of policy making? You know, how does the city both encourage a certain level investment of, of investment while at the same time trying to temper that investment because it has it, it, it has parallel or sometimes contradictory interests to advance at the same time. Thank you. And I'll just uh, end with one last question again for both of you. Um, some of the panels earlier today have talked about the importance of sustainable homeownership. And I mentioned the foreclosure rates in New Jersey. Um, in addition, Michael's research highlighted um, the the uh, negative equity in many homes uh, in Newark. So I wanted each of you to talk a little bit about how your data can inform efforts for sustainable home ownership that folks can both access home ownership, uh, sustain that home ownership and benefit in terms of wealth from that home ownership. We know there's disparities in both rates of home ownership and how much families of color gain in terms of financial benefits from that home ownership. So how can we support the long-term wealth building home ownership uh, for families of color in Newark and beyond? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great question, Laura. Um, you know, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, A, um, certainly, uh, you know, data uh, around uh, not just uh, down payment assistance, um, but also uh, a c combining that with uh, a savings account um, that can uh, that can help with future uh, renovation needs. I, mean, I think someone earlier um, really brought out the fact that um, the, those first few years of home ownership can oftentimes be precarious, particularly for homeowners of color. Um, you know, the data that, that we showed here uh, uh, implies um, that the housing stock um, across, uh, across the city um, is relatively older. If there's less new construction, that suggests that the housing stock is, is, is older. Um, and so that suggests, you know, the need for, for, for kind of the renovation financing um, as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the second thing I think um, is, again, kind of the data uh, on, the, on, on the supply side. 
um, you know, uh, suggesting the need uh, not just for new construction, but also kind of the the sort the the the, the, the types of products. Um, David talked a lot about you know the institutional buyers and you know how do you you know what are the steps that need to be taken in order to uh, you know in order to, to to replace that housing stock, whether that's you know preserving homes that are already out there or building new homes or or anything along those lines. Um, as you know, part of you know, uh, you know the the challenge that 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 his analysis um, has really brought to light. Um, the final thing that I'll say uh, with sustaining uh, home ownership uh, over and above kind of you know the cyclical aspect of it um, uh, is uh, around non financial costs. Um, we've looked at data from the American Time Use Survey, um, which suggests that uh, you know we that homeowners. Um, uh, spend more time maintaining their home um, relative to renters. That, that's an intuitive kind of result. Um, but in fact, that low-income homeowners spend more time uh, maintaining their home uh, than, than higher-income homeowners. And I think part of that story um, is because uh, lower-income homeowners are much more likely uh, to live in inadequate uh, 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 housing. Um, but at the same time, um, they may not have the income um, to actually pay someone else to do it. And so there becomes this kind of opportunity cost uh, kind of challenge that I think something like uh, homeowner counseling can really speak to. That is that it goes beyond just uh, what we call the user cost of home ownership. That is, you know, I'm no longer a renter, I'm now a homeowner. And what are all the costs that I now have to face in terms of renovations and property taxes and things like that? Um, but at the same time, you know, what are the non-financial costs that I'm going to have to face? Like you're, you're going to spend more time, you know, with your house uh, on the weekends than probably you were, you did, than probably you did as a renter. <clears throat> yeah, boy, Laura, that's a very difficult question. Um, I wish I had a good answer or at least an optimistic, an optimistic one. I, I think it's, it's, it's easy to want this, um, but it's really hard to expect it because uh, the trends are moving in the opposite direction. Um, you know, one way to try to, to, to create um, more long-term, more, more, more permanence, more sustainability of home ownership is to preserve what's there. I mean, I think a preservation status is, a, a preservation approach is very important. And we found this was the case in the affordable rental housing context as well. But from the standpoint of, 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 of new home buyers, you know, with rates going up, it's increasing the costs with the amount of sales activity that's gone on. We know that CDCs are being beat out by corporate buyers for properties that they intended to, to, to make either affordable uh, home ownership uh, opportunities or affordable uh, rental opportunities. And, um, and therefore, that's some indication of a market that is, that is appreciating one way or the other, however you, you want to characterize. But, but we're seeing inflationary prices. I suppose some people could look at that as success, but the price for success will be a diminishing number of people who, from within the city who can afford uh, uh, home ownership. And so the, like, the greater likelihood is that you'll begin asking the question about sustainable home ownership among people who have come from without. Um, and, and, and so we're gonna have to be much more creative. I imagine we'll have to be uh, much more particularistic in the kinds of programs that we put in place to support both those who already own their homes and those um, who are preparing to buy homes within the city and some of the folks who are coming in from without. Well, thank you so much, uh, both of you, to your, for your great presentations, your important data and research and how it informs um, both Newark and New Jersey. Um, I'm going to pass um, the uh, mic to Vanessa Perry, who's a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute, as well as a professor of marketing, strategic management, and public policy at the George Washington University. And I, I imagine that uh, their panel will be able to address some of these que uh, questions of sustainability and what's happening in Newark. So hopefully that will continue the conversation. Vanessa? Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, again, I'm Vanessa Perry, and I'm delighted to participate today and to moderate this uh, panel of distinguished uh, members of the housing ecosystem and contributors to the housing ecosystem in Newark. Um, we are here to talk about some of the complexities of both non-governmental -gov actors and their interaction with 
governmental actors um, that can help sort of determine home ownership outcomes, again, with a particular focus on Newark and building on some of the prior uh, discussions that we've had today. So the question is really, how can stakeholders from the practitioner world help alleviate home ownership challenges faced, home ownership challenges faced by households of color, particularly among the COVID-19 pandemic and what help can, can we provide? So our panelists include, and these are in alphabetical order, uh, Laura Graneman, who's vice president of the strategic investments at Rocket Community Fund. We have John Restrepo, who's chair of the board of directors of the Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey. We have Katine Sherer L, executive director of the Clinton Hill Community Action. And we have uh, Ruben T, executive director of PGIM, that is the Prudential Global Investment Manager Real Estate. So I'm going to kick us off. Uh, I have questions that I will direct to particular panelists just to kind of get us started on a topic, but I'm hoping then that everyone will have a chance to kind of chime in from their perspective. So my first question is for uh, Katim, and I'm hoping you will tell us a tad bit about your organization to start and then answer the following. So from your work, that is leading a new community development organization that's focused on housing. Can you give us your take on the housing ecosystem in Newark? Thanks so much, Vanessa, and thanks to the Urban Institute and Prudential for making today happen. Um, I just got word that I only have two minutes to respond, so I can't do all of that that time. Um, but we're a community development organization uh, here in the city of Newark. Uh, we're new, the new kids on the block, and I think our perspective is, is really interesting because we're in a massive learning mode. And so as I think about the local ecosystem and sort of our context, I see it as very similar to, you know, what's happening in other communities. I lived in Atlanta, so it was good to hear from our friends there. Um, and so I like to think of this in sort of what I call the three P's plus the F. You know, people, place, and policy, and then there's always the need for funding. And I offer this framework just as an example for my friends across the country to think about sort of what your uh, community and ecosystem looks like. So on the people side, you heard from our mayor, you heard from a number of leaders in our sort of housing and economic development field. We've got the right people in place. You just heard from uh, David Trout and the Climb Institute at Rutgers, the research that's happening to help us better understand the local context and the complexity of this I issue is just invaluable. So figure out sort of how that sort of fits in your in your locale. Um, but when I think about our place, sort of that second P in this equation, um, you also heard sort of this wild, wild west of market forces that have for too long been driving the agenda around housing. Um, but you also heard how the city has begun to kind of push against that, slowing its tax sales to more strategically leverage its portfolio of vacant land and of abandoned properties to support uh, uh, our goals around equitable growth and development. But still, we've got speculators that make this sort of work really hard. And since so the third P in this equation, around policy, and I can't emphasize this point enough, um, this is where listening becomes so critical, right? So as a practitioner on the ground, to have the ear of our mayor on these issues, who's made it a priority, um, established a commission, the Equitable Growth Commission, where we can go deep dive on these issues, make recommendations to the administration and see those uh, come to life and things like our inclusionary zoning, which was recently strengthened uh, to our affordable task force that I was a part of that put a stake in the ground and made a goal to produce 3,000 new homes and 6,000 affordable homes by 2026. Um, and so those three pleas plus this sort of last element around funding, which I 
think is really critical. Um, and I have to you know, say for my colleagues on the ground, there's never enough money out there to do this work. Um, but to hear that the governor is putting $400 million in housing, to hear our mayor leverage uh, our local resources to do the same and see our corporate and private philanthropy, players like Prudential, the Victoria Foundation, my friends at Mar Charitable Foundation, our anchors like our hospital system, all come together and sort of look at ways they can complement the investment in housing to sort of fill the gaps that are needed around the capacity for front leaders like myself uh, to be able to access these dollars and make things happen. In short, I would say the real sort of takeaway from all of this is not to get lost in the sort of forest for the trees analogy, but really look at both the pieces, but how they fit together. And when I think about Nork's story and how those pieces are fitting together, uh, we have a situation much like uh, many of you where we're swimming upstream against these market forces that don't share our same goals for affordability and, and equity. Um, we're moving fast, but we can never move fast enough to sort of meet the, de the demand for housing for all. But I, I'll close and say, I really still believe that our time is now because we have the right leaders at the helm, Vanessa. Great, so thank you. And thanks for that great kickoff. Um, I think we are, we are now in the thick of it. So Ruben, um, I would love to hear your thoughts or any additions you have uh, with respect to the ecosystem. And, uh, but first, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Sure, uh, so I'm, I'm Ruben Tag. I work within the Impact and Responsible Investments Group at Prudential uh, within PGM Real Estate. Um, Prudential has had an impact investments function for uh, over 40 years, which makes us uh, one of the oldest institutional impact investors. And while we've been doing that work, we've been focused on our home city of Newark. Um, and just in the last decade, uh, we've invested over $350 million into uh, impact investments within Newark. Um, it, to go along with our broader corporate uh, contributions and investment in Newark, which total well over a billion dollars. Uh, and that's important to us because Newark's been our home city for all 150 years of our existence. And so the health of the city and the health of Prudential are inextricably intertwined. And we're going to continue to make those kinds of investments. And that's what I get to do for my job, which is great. Um, you know, I can't build very much on what Katim said and his enthusiasm for all the right people that we've got in place across the city. I'll say that, you know, I've been uh, working on this for a while and I agree there are the talent level I don't think has ever been higher uh, in terms of the different people that have come together to focus on what it's gonna take to make Newark a really attractive, appealing and accessible place to live. Um, I will add uh, that there are some key players that he didn't mention who I would say are not necessarily helping. Um, and I, I wanna call that out because I think it's important in this context to think about uh, what are some of the forces that can slow things down, make life a little more difficult? Um, and in Newark, I think one of the you know, historic issues that we've had is um, not with public land banking, but with private land banking and with uh, people who have purchased properties and sat on them uh, and allowed them to degrade over time, uh, waiting for maybe the right moment to sell or perhaps never really being willing to sell. Um, and, you know, Newark, I think, as a city uh, for a long time, allowed some of those folks to do that uh, without taking action to kind of push development forward. And the city's changed its posture on that, which I think is great. Uh, I think that's going to be really critical to bring some of these properties off the bench and into commerce um, and open them up uh, as opportunities for development uh, and housing in particular. Uh, the second uh, group, I would say, is that, you know, in an issue that we've got in Newark relates to the amount of land that is dedicated to the metal boxes that we drive around in all the time. Uh, we've got parking that is um, at times one of the biggest obstacles to intelligent and capable development in the city. Um, and the folks who are sitting on large parking holdings um, are uh, in some cases starting to think about how they can develop that land. But I think in other cases, uh, we need to think a little bit about whether that's an investment we wanna to continue to make. And as the city grows, how can we reduce our dependence on auto transport so that more space within the city can be made available for people to live in, not for auto storage? Um, 
I, I think the last thing I'll say is that in the last seven or eight years, what you have seen, uh, you know, is a willingness of many of the real estate development organizations that have historically operated in New Jersey to look at Newark as a potential market. Um, and I think uh, for the purpose of this conversation, I think people would look at that as a double-edged sword. From my standpoint, I think it's great that people are thinking about the fact that uh, they expect uh, real estate values in Newark to appreciate, and that's why they want to invest there. Um, I think the question is, how do we channel that energy um, and make use of it so that the resulting economic growth is as inclusive as possible? Um, so, you know, I think the, the problem of having folks who work, uh, you know, works traditionally in Jersey City or Hoboken or out in the suburbs wanting to invest in Newark is a good one to have. Um, but we need to be ready to think about what do we do with that. Thank you. Thank you. Really great points. Uh, let's see, Laura or John, do you have anything to add about our housing ecosystem in, in Newark before I... Hi, Vanessa. How are you? Hey, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Restrepo. I'm the chair of the board of the Housing and Community Development Network. We have about 150 members statewide and primarily focus on capacity building and uh, advocacy at the state level and local level. I'm also the director of housing for a local nonprofit in North Jersey uh, that has been operating for 30 years, done about 400 units, uh, most of it home ownership, and I'm the principal of Restrepo and Associates. I've been doing affordable housing uh, from 20 years, I come from an underinvested area that's uh, impacted my household. This is a life mission for me. Affordable housing, I'm a big believer. It's a tool for change and it improves lives. Uh, I think my role here is to talk about how, how we can build the capital stack to address the supply issue that was mentioned by a lot of the, uh, the folks on the policy side here. And it's, it's very simple, uh, guys. Without subsidy, there is no affordable housing. No lender will get into a deal without it. Uh, the private sector does play a, a very critical role for those uh, nonprofits that are more sophisticated and further along in, in, uh, in, in the development of, of, of properties. And so we were able here in Hudson County uh, to get a private lender to give us a $2 million line of credit and just recently bought two properties in Hudson County to produce affordable housing. And it's one of the most competitive markets and it's a model that can be done and duplicated and scaled uh, elsewhere. But without subsidy, nothing's really possible. Uh, and without affordable housing, it will be very hard to get the home ownership rate uh, for minorities in places like Newark, Irvington, East Orange. Uh, subsidy is the only mechanism to create the bridge between low-income families and the cost to buy a house. It offsets the cost to develop to offer at a distant price. So uh, when you look at the population income and others have covered this uh, very well versus the cost to buy, there's a huge disconnect. It's not reachable. There's a gap of 200 and 300 grand. A person earning 35 grand a year can afford a single family at 165,000, a two family may be at 220. When you look at the pricing in the market today, those families cannot afford that. They will not be able to get a mortgage or they're gonna buy a house that's too beat up and needs too much work and is unsuitable for a family to live there. Uh, this was all aggravated by 9-11 uh, back at the turn of the century. That's when we first saw New Yorkers jumping into Jersey City. And now those that can no longer afford Jersey City are pushing into west of New Jersey uh, prior to COVID, but now with COVID, it's even more aggravated. So how can we increase the supply of low-cost homes? We did it. We did it here in Hudson County. We did it with local home dollars, and we did so because we had the cooperation of the administrators who were also practitioners in the field and were very responsive and accessible to us. We worked in six municipalities, did 183 units. We redeveloped 90 vacant properties, and the uh, average income of our uh, families was 50 grand a year. Right now, uh, they have over $300,000 in equity, which is equal to the gap in New Jersey between white and black families. And we're utilizing the gentrification of Jersey City as a mechanism to build wealth for, for, for minorities. We leverage it and do as much of affordable housing in, in markets that we know are gonna explode so that we're leveraging it and creating future gains for these populations and changing the generational poverty and, 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 and one, in, in one cycle. What are our results? 90% of our buyers were either black or Latino families. 80% of them were local, 33 were single moms. We generated close to $300,000 in new revenues for the municipalities on vacant lots that were not producing any taxes. Uh, this cost $50 million to do. Uh, 29 of it was subsidy, 22 of it was sales. 
Uh, and all of our buyers, close to 100 of them, were never searching, were never looking for brokers because their heart was broken and they knew they can't buy. So we're actually tapping and creating a market. And so what the mayor said about gentrifying Newark with the existing residents, it's completely doable, it's doable right now. I say we got to get to it before the pricing goes up even more because the market forces that we're all talking about it are out of control and the pricing for land and property is only going to continue to go up. So there's, that's where the trust fund comes in. Uh, I heard someone mention that the governor has made a commitment. Right now, there's about $80 million in the trust fund to be utilized for this kind of stuff. The network played a role in structuring the way the, the, uh, the trust fund works. Uh, this is where you have uh, an important conversation with, between policy and practitioners to advise what's going on in the streets and what will actually work. The first version of it did not include home ownership and we pushed for it and it was included, okay? Uh, on the development side as a nonprofit, we're now doing a project in, in um, East Orange that just got committed. Uh, we should start construction in the fall. And uh, we just got an offer accepted in uh, Bayonne to do 16 condominiums. And uh, that project, it's, it's a goal uh, as well. Uh, the problem that we're facing today as far as production, right? And what the CDCs are not able to do has to do with the drought that we had during the eight years of Governor Christie. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund was not utilized to create any new units, it was diverted. It was almost a decade of lost opportunity. Without state subsidy, many places cannot develop at all or enough. Take an example, East Orange has a total annual allocation from HUD of 300 grand, the city of Newark, $2 million. It's about $200,000 per unit in subsidy today. So if you divide the 200 into the 2 million that Newark has, they'll produce 10 units of affordable housing if they were relying only on their home dollars. This is why developers have to leverage the low-income housing tax credits, uh, that's only for rental. And so there was no piece of large subsidy that addressed this issue in New Jersey. The last piece was the choice program from HMFA. And so the trust fund is the place. Once you have that subsidy in place, you can leverage the acquisition, the lines of credits, the pre-development, the construction and permanent financing. The biggest problem outside of the subsidy in the beginning stages of development is the C capital to make offers and do due diligence, okay? But with the trust fund, if you take, uh, the $80 million that you have today, and if it costs 200K per unit because the cost of acquisition and construction is going up, you could do 500 units for the next two units, that's 2,000 units, okay? We're not spending the affordable housing trust fund enough because there is a problem with capacity in the state because the industry is aging out. And if you have players uh, that do not play ball for eight years and start retiring, there's no question, well, we don't have enough production. So we have to also address uh, the capacity issues in the network and other people like LISC are working uh, to, to address that. Um, and so that's more or less what I think is the landscape. The message here is subsidy, subsidy, the subsidies here, let's get it together. Let's match subsidy with sites and we can start building right now to address the, issue, the supply issue. Awesome, thank you so much for that overview. So Laura, um, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. And in particular, uh, what I'm curious about is how the ecosystem in Newark, from your perspective, differs from what you've seen in other cities where you've been involved with this kind of work. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate the opportunity to, to join this, this panel and appreciate my other panelists for, for the conversation. Um, so my name is Laura Graneman. I lead the, the Rocket Community Fund and the Gilbert Family Foundation. Um, the Rocket Community Fund is the philanthropic arm of Rocket Mortgage and Rocket Companies. Um, so our work it really is across the country. We do have a deep, deep presence in the city of Detroit, which is our hometown. Um, and the Gilbert Family Foundation is uh, the private uh, family foundation for our, our founder and chairman, Dan Gilbert. Um, again, we do a lot of work uh, deeply in Detroit. Uh, we focus on breaking down generational barriers and jumpstarting economic opportunity. And a lot of that is through first starting with stable housing um, and then growing uh, from there because we, we do take a, a very housing first philosophy. We believe that housing is so important to every other component of life. So, um, that's a little bit about our organization. 
Uh, and what I can't do is weigh in specifically on Newark and the ecosystem in Newark because we, we, uh, I've, I am not there. Uh, but what I can do is something very important, I think, which is uh, validation of what I'm hearing from other panelists, what I know about Newark. Uh, certainly is uh, a trend that we're seeing across the country. Uh, you know, we see some of the same challenges with um, stock, quality stock, uh, especially in, in cities across the United States. Um, it is a challenge for anyone to be able to subsidize um, housing stock enough to be able to make uh, the critical repairs that need to happen across the country, to be able to create affordable housing uh, from a home ownership perspective and from a rental perspective. Um, and I would also say there's a significant racial home ownership gap that's happening across the United States. Um, and that is a, a real focus of our work um, across the US uh, philanthropically and as a business to try to make sure that we are driving systemic change that will um, you know, unlock that access to financing for um, everyone equitably across the United States. So um, lots of validation there. Uh, I think what we've seen in the, in the city of Detroit is um, a, another really critical trend has been the, um, the change from um, home ownership, which Detroit has historically been a, a home ownership first city to now a, a rental majority uh, city. And um, while you know renting is a very important tool, affordable rental housing is a very important tool to, to help people uh, start their, their journey. Um, and some folks are not, not going to want to become homeowners, that is okay. Uh, what we do know is that it's also very, very important if we're going to build generational wealth, that homeownership is an incredibly important tool um, in that conversation. And so uh, we have been really fighting against the, uh, the trend of, of rental in the city of Detroit, uh, because a lot of that has been caused by something that I heard one of my other panelists talking more about, which is um, people who are homeowners and may not re realize that they also uh, need to pay their property taxes um, or they may uh, see a property tax bill that they just cannot afford. So we've seen huge numbers of property tax foreclosures, um, some really big uh, increases to our Detroit Land Bank Authority uh, ownership of properties, uh, which then gets to one of the other trends that was just talked about um, around making sure that we're strategically utilizing land across the city of Detroit and across the United States. So again, lots of validation of all of these trends that I'm hearing from other panelists. Um, and I think certainly uh, the talent is there to be able to address these problems. These are man-made problems, uh, human-made problems. Uh, they can only be addressed by humans themselves. So we can do this. Uh, we just have to have a real consistent vision um, and be able to, to articulate that to private, uh, public, nonprofit partners across the United States. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you very much. That's a um, perfect transition. So up to this point, we've kind of been laying out the kind of status quo um, in Newark. And Laura, you were kind enough to sort of set that against what you've seen in Detroit and perhaps other cities. So now I'd like to switch a bit to um, what, to, to sort of a deep dive on the unmet needs. And so as not to go in the mm -hmm. same order mm -hmm. at all times, I'm going to pick on Katine uh, and ask you uh, to just sort of kick us off at least on now, what is needed to help boost home ownership, um, in particular among Black and Latinx households in, in Newark? Yeah. And what have you learned based on your experience there that that can help inform uh, going moving forward? Yeah. Well, well, one of the things we have to do is. Uh, get the Urban Institute to follow through on their commitment to get this recording from today's session out to everyone, because this is sort of a university lesson on sort of what can happen when you bring all of these inputs together from the policymakers to the researchers to people on the ground like myself and John and others, and sort of hear all of these ideas. But you know, the one thing I will say, I'm swimming, y'all. This has been great information, ideas, and possibilities, um, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. 
Um, as an organization, we're committed to keeping residents at the center of our work. Um, and so I can't start sort of answering your question without saying that we've got to take these conversations to the streets, right? It does us a disservice to just talk to each other. Uh, we have to engage those who have been directly impacted by this issue because that is our biggest resource. The people power that can help us advocate for the changes and the resources that we need um, are in the very you know, folks who we are trying to help. And really, you know, we've got to do more of creating a sense of self-sufficiency and self-determination in those that we are trying to uh, support. Just said simply, we can't talk about equity for African-American and Latino communities without giving those who we are trying to help a sense of agency. Right at Clinton Hill Community Action, that's like the core of you know our work. Like nothing for us without us. Um, and if for nothing else, you know this conversation with community about the complexity of this issue, our commitment to try to do something about it, um, and some of the challenges that we're seeing, like marginalized communities have been disserviced for so long that they've stopped believing. And somehow or another, we've got to get people to believe again that all of these pieces of our ecosystem are committed to uh, the benefit of, of, of our community. On the funding side, I'm saying to my policymaker friends uh, that we got to look at some of these barriers that exist to accessing dollars, right? Um, whether that's the overly complex applications that exist to be able to, you know, get affordable housing development dollars. Um, and, and in fact, we should take a page at, you know, what happened during the pandemic, there were a lot of lessons that can be learned with the appropriate guardrails moving fast to get money out to those who got dem demonstrated capacity um, proved to really help us in our sort of V-line recovery. Um, and lastly, on the funding side, I'd say we've got to figure out a way to better fund this work. I mean, it floors me. Um, when I think about the idea that we go to the state housing trust fund, the national housing trust fund to get what? 50% on the dollar of what's needed to develop affordable housing. Like where do folks think the rest of that money is going to come from? Um, so if we want to really commit to this issue, we got to fully fund it. Um, and then I'll, I'll close with, um, I think that there are enough building blocks in all of our cities to do good work, right? We've got, you know, programs, we've got policies, we've got people, all the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, we just got to make sure those things that currently exist are working as they should. Like, I feel like we go from headline to headline, right? We get a flashpoint, people get excited about something, and then we move on. And then we say, oh, wow, how many people did we register for the rent ordinance? Or how's that inclusionary zoning thing going where developers are committing to you know, affordable housing? There's got to be more commitment around continuous improvement and what we have and accountability to what we have, which is why partners like the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice here in the state are really critical because they put out the reports that change the conversation. Um, and I'm particularly pointing to their most recent one on making the two New Jersey's one, where they looked at sort of this issue of the wealth gap and the role that housing plays. And that becomes a real sort of call to action for folks. And so we need more of that sort of check and balance on how this ecosystem is working and not working um, uh, as well. Great. Thank you. So Ruben, what do you think? What are our sort of real unmet needs? that we need to address in order to be able to start closing the home ownership gap? Well, you know, having listened to the prior presentations and thought a lot about the data here, you know, I do want to emphasize not to be a downer, but to just make it clear that it's very hard to change home ownership rates anywhere in the United States at any time. You know, we uh, as a society made a decision um, back uh, during the uh, Roosevelt years and immediately following that we thought more Americans should be homeowners and we managed to get the home ownership rate up to about 65 percent nationally uh, in 1965 and the home ownership rate nationally is about 65 percent today. It hasn't budged very much despite years and years of policy. The racial gap in home ownership has also been extremely persistent um, and it is probably the single potential greatest lever for wealth creation in the United States is closing that racial home ownership gap. Um, but the, the same reasons that it's hard to increase home ownership overall throughout the population 
exist when you're trying to target a specific subpopulation. And given historic patterns of segregation and redlining, uh, you know, some of those reasons are actually even more difficult to overcome. Um, so not, again, I, I don't, I want to emphasize that to get to a point where we have higher home ownership rate among a particular subgroup within Newark um, is going to really be uh, at some level hand-to-hand -hand combat around getting each individual family that is currently in that renter population ready to and in the pipeline to acquire a home. Um, you know, I, I think about the Invest Newark program, which I think is probably, uh, you know, maybe our best program right now for moving people from being renters to being homeowners, which is working at the big end of the funnel to try to bring people in and get them ready to buy. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but I'm pretty sure the number is well below 20% of the people who come into that program come out the other side ready to really buy a home. Um, and they get screened out for all kinds of reasons, low credit scores, low incomes, um, kind of a, you know, maybe they weren't really ready to actually take on the burdens of home ownership. Um, so in order to get more people out the other end of that funnel, we have to get more people in. We've got to get more people trying to access these programs, figure out who some of these folks are who are ready to move from, from being renters to being homeowners. At the other end, we're not producing, um, as the data shows, very many houses that are ready for purchase in a given year in Newark. Um, you know, right now, housing production is still relatively low, um, you know, compared to demand. And so if we wanted to uh, focus on how do we more quickly move property from where it sits today in some of the, you know, uh, blighted and vacant conditions that it's in, more quickly make that available for redevelopment, get that in the hands of builders who can then turn it around and, and move it to these homeowners, I think that would be another place that we could look at in order to try to increase access. I guess the last thing I would say is, and John, you may have something to say about this. You know, New Jersey does have a first time home buyer program and, and a subsidy program available. Um, and I wonder if there's a way to make that a more targeted program to address some of these issues. Um, you know, for example, there are, there's a difference in my mind between a first time home buyer and a first generation home buyer. And the opportunity to build wealth is really with that first generation home buyer who comes from a family where there never was home ownership in the prior generation. They're not going to inherit a house from their parents. And I wonder if we might think a little bit more about how do we target some of these existing programs to reach this population if we all agree that this is a problem that we can solve. And like I said, I think it is a very high leverage opportunity to create wealth in the United States. And specifically in Newark, I guess the last thing I'll say is all of these problems that we're talking about exist not in a Newark context, but in a regional context. Newark is, and, and the challenges we face there on affordability are a result of poor housing policy across the Metro New York region for decades. And we have failed to build housing to meet the population growth needs. And that starts right in the middle of New York City, and it goes out from there in every direction. I would say New Jersey in some ways has done a lot better, honestly, than other places around the region in terms of picking up the slack for population growth. Um, but you know, the failure to accommodate population growth has created this extremely unaffordable and deeply segregated metropolitan area. And Newark is not the cause of that. We are the symptom and the victim, I would say, of some of these uh, poor policy choices. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was going to uh, ask, I was going to direct the next sort of line of questioning to John anyway, and then you sort of brought up an opportunity for him to talk about the way that some of the programs are structured. Uh, so John, feel free to address that if you uh, have the opportunity. And also, if you could just talk a little bit about um, what you think is the appropriate role for uh, government. I mean, you talked earlier about subsidies and how none of this can happen without subsidies. But what kind of government assistance is helpful and what is not so helpful? You are mute, I think, John. Yeah, Sorry. I was getting there. Hi. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. And um, so, look, I mean, someone mentioned about decades of bad policy. How do we fix that money? Simple. Okay, we need more subsidy at the federal level. I just gave you some numbers. Let's, let's do the math. 
80 million dollars uh gets you 500 units that gets you 2000 right so the local municipalities would be great if, if they figure out how to do it as well inclusionary zoning is one way if there's a strong market uh generate some fees um there's different ways uh you know, to, to address that. But I want to address two things that Ruben, I guess, uh, asked me. The the down payment program, and I, I the first, there is a big difference between first time and generational, but just addressing the down payment program, and I believe that's with HMFA, uh, the network actually challenged that program because we felt that it did not have the appropriate impact and it was not targeting uh, the right populations. And so the down payment assistance programs do work but it depends on the market forces. In New York, they're giving 100 grand. Why? Because it's very expensive. So what is the appropriate number of down payment assistance on the backside to buy down the cost of buying a home for a family earning 35 grand? It's probably more than 100 grand, Ruben. And so that's, that's the problem. And then the other thing is, I'm not sure your statistics and uh, what market, but I'll give you my experience here in Jersey City. Uh, just recently, we marketed four homes. I got 100 applications. We do a priority for residents of our neighborhood revitalization tax credit plan. And we got in the first 10 that we do a priority order, great credit scores, great savings. And so we are having no issue finding buyers at all. The problem is the supply. I will tell you, if I build a thousand homes today, I'll find a thousand buyers by next month, no problem. Uh, so we don't have a demand issue or a preparation issue uh, from the buyers. Uh, as to the comment about Newark and why nothing's being built there is the simple math, okay? If it, today's cost is $450,000 to build a two-family home, which is a primary, a primary uh, component of the Newark housing market, and you could only sell it for $450,000, no investor is going to build anything. They're going to focus on the rehabs because they haven't paid for acquisition. They haven't made a profit. They haven't paid the architect. That's why you have so much vacant land. And I keep saying it, the opportunity is right now. If uh, you can put a system together to knock out those vacant lots in, in, in those regions pretty quickly, if you have the capacity and alignment of, of, of minds, really. So to me, what can government do other, other than money, okay, is to help the system. It's great if the local municipality can contribute, but for me to tap the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, all I need is a, a letter of support from the mayor and a city council resolution in support, not money, not land, okay? We could figure out the land. There's parity of private parcels. Uh, if the city wants to throw in land, whatever city, that's great. But I think that the problem is the, the time. We're losing time. If you look at the Jersey City story, 20 years ago, I can buy vacant lots in Jersey City for $20,000. And the population that I was serving in Greenville, which is a hundred block radius, the, the poorest community in Hudson County, the median income was 30 grand, is still 30 grand in the middle of gentrification. So to me, the answer to this, to try to turn the switch and, and push the tide in, in, in a little bit in the opposite direction is to crank up the affordable housing production. Besides money, what do we need? Uh, we need the municipalities to help us with the planning zoning process. It's a problem if it takes a year for me to get planning approval, because if I have a private site, I cannot hold the contract for more than three months. Uh, sewer permits, MUAs, utility permits, and PSCNG and SUS. I've had six, eight month delays in projects because of that. It's taken me sometimes, I won't name municipalities, a year to get planning approval. So in the inspection process, tax abatements, okay? If the city is gonna tr contribute land, there has to be an, ex an expeditious site disposition process in a comprehensive way to kind of figure out who's doing what and how we could coordinate the time for uh, production. And I wanna reiterate what Katim said, you know, you got to have the right people at the right place and the folks that are in charge of the money and all these systems, they have to be professionals in the field. It's not something that you get into and try to figure out because if that's the case, it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, I have a partner over here in Hudson County. She is the home director. And a lot of the stuff that we built is because of that capacity at the government side. In Jersey City, in our great days when there was plenty of land, because there's a lot of land uh, not available now, part of the reason we were so productive is because there were administrators that A, cared, knew what they were doing, and will advocate to the city council, to the mayor, and anybody else to get the deal going. And so we need administrators that understand the process, understand the financing, understand the issues, all right, and that are have good communication and access. And also for 
uh, if this is so important and we got to ramp up the, the production, you know, we need developers that are chosen because of their capacity as well. Uh, and if you can connect all this, then, you know, the production would be unbelievable, but it's a matter of will in many different uh, uh, places. Uh, government, uh, some impediments, right? The examples, like I might need a subordination on a loan. I can't have it taken six months, discharges, environmental reviews. There's a lot of pieces that government slows down. And for them to be a true partner, we need the dollars to leverage the private capital, but also the proper systems to do this in an effective way. It's really not that complicated. This is not rocket science. We don't need Elon Musk. It's affordable housing. We can do this, okay? And so I would say the will, the collaboration, it's simple math. Today, last month, I sold a house on 98 Myrtle in Jersey City for 165 grand to a family from the Bronx that makes 40 grand, okay? We're selling four houses right now, had 100 applicants. I'm looking at four buyers from the neighborhood. They're selling for 350. To families earning 45 grand, all of them come from the neighborhood. I'm selling two condos for 75 grand. That is the supply that we need, but it's peanuts compared to the need. But if $80 million is there, the all the ingredients are here to make the sauce. Okay, they're here. And so the time is now, and I'm hoping that we can make up some time for the decade that we lost under Governor Christie, because if and I feel comfortable saying this, you know, the Republican Party is not very supportive of affordable housing. If we have another Republican governor coming up, you can best believe we're gonna have a problem getting this funding. So while it's here, let's put it to work. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and though, you know, you say it's not rocket science, um, the way Katim described this problem is the wild, wild west of market forces and so, uh, I think it actually is complicated, at least for some, in terms of pulling all this together. I wanna try to get a couple of questions in from the chat, uh, if at all possible. One is uh, how do we address the affordability gap between the rents that state and federal subsidy programs support and the rent that many newer residents can afford to pay? How can we change the economics of local housing development to close that gap? So I'm gonna open it up for whoever wants to jump in on that one first. Don't everybody raise their hands at once. I feel like I'm in class again. <laughs> I mean, I, I was leaving the floor to, to John to kind of wax poetically about this point because this is sort of the drumbeat that he's been making. Like, you got to invest in this, right? Like, it ain't just going to happen because we wish and want it to if we're not putting the dollars into these projects to make them as affordable as they need to, it's, it's not going to happen. Like the financing, the marketing, the market and, and everything else is just not there. Uh, one of the things that we looked at when we just sort of opened up the pro forma of a affordable housing development project, we looked at all of the inputs, right? The dollars that we can get from all the public sources by way of subsidy, some of the senior debt that, you know, some of our development partners, you know, they got a little equity they can bring to the table and a gap still exists to be able to meet the kind of affordability goals that the Rutgers Climb report showed us in terms of our local context of what Norkers can afford. And we still had a hole. We still had a hole. But for the generosity of our philanthropic community, like the Victoria Foundation, like Prudential, and, and I mentioned earlier, the Mar Charitable Foundation, the Schumann Fund, some of our local funders who are looking and paying attention to this issue, we would never be able to build affordable housing at the level that's needed in our community. And so it's a mix of those different pots. Um, but I don't know, John, how, how sustainable that is. I mean, we may be able to yeah. do this with a good funding cycle from our philanthropic partners, but what happens when their priorities change? Yeah, uh, Katim, I have not used any foundation dollars to build any of my units. Um, and I, the only thing that I will point out is that there are no maximum subsidy limits in the affordable housing like there is with HUD programs. So... Uh, if you want to revisit that gap, uh, you could with, with, with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. But Vanessa, to your question, how do we bridge the rental gap is the same thing. Same thing. It's just a different financial structuring. You got rents, operating expenses, you figure out how much debt. The owner doesn't have that in their calculation. But either way, it's a matter of either subsidizing on the front side or uh, generating, uh, uh, you know, the, the tenant-based vouchers to the housing authority or some other government body 
uh, to pay, you know, market rate units. There is no other way that I know of, uh, but the way that I can control is the subsidy. You know, we can drive the cost down. We can compete in the market. We are, we're beating out investors with the line of credits that we have with the experience. We just bought a lot in, on, in Jersey City and one in Bayonne, and these are like the hottest markets in the state. The formula is there. I'd be happy to share it uh, with whoever wants access to it. It can be scaled. It can be duplicated anywhere in the whole country. As long as you know, there's subsidy, uh, it can be designed. You know, we spent 20 years really looking at Jersey City Greenville neighborhood and the finding mechanisms. We don't uh, rely on consultants. So literally we had to build the in-house capacity as community developers to really look at single, two family, multifamily, mixed use, rehabs, every single thing that you can think of, it's in the neighborhood. And so to produce, we had to figure out these mechanisms and we, you could do it in Newark, you could do it anywhere. It's it, again, a function of the subsidy being available, the regulations around the subsidy uh, making sense because if there's a sharp increase in cost for development and construction, there should be a lift in the maximum per unit subsidies that Katim is trying to access so that he doesn't have a gap. So it needs to be reflective on, on true costs. You know, the federal government just increased that cap. The uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund doesn't have that cap. And so there's, there's, way, there's ways to, 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 to make this work. There's ways to make this work. I'm not preaching. I'm backing it up. Come see me in Hudson County. It's here. Well, folks, we really are out of time. I can't believe it. This could go on for the rest of the night, but we actually have some other things on the agenda that we're going to have to get to. So, um, but there's been so much of a rich sharing of information here. Um, there are a number of questions that we won't be able to get to that have been offered by our panelists, but I hope what that means is that we can keep this conversation going. Uh, among all of these parties. And so I want to thank everybody for their taking time out of their busy schedules to share this, this information with us today um, and these sort of expert uh, thoughts and opinions. I just caught a, taught a class earlier today called Markets and Politics, and I should have just made my students uh, sign on and listen to this. It would have been just a master class in studying markets and politics and what's going on in the real world. So thank you all for your hard work. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany Jackson and my colleague, Yannicka, Rat Rat Yannicka Radcliffe. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. And thank you to what I think is a great way to, to segue into our closing. Um, what a really great conversation. Um, and what a wonderful event uh, filled with great discussions and rich content. And I am personally filled with a great sense of optimism at what collectively we can achieve together with integrated systems at the federal, state, and local level, coupled with close collaboration with community-based organizations and, and anchor institutions and advocates and residents. And if we continue to challenge each other, challenge each other in the status quo, um, we can achieve so much. And uh, we are running really short on time. And I think it was so important just to get as much of that great discussion in. And so I will keep my remarks really brief and extend just a really um, heartfelt and sincere thank you to the Urban Institute um, for producing this great, great program for the rich, rich research that is so additive to the North ecosystem, to our friends and partners um, that joined us as panelists and moderators especially from our, our uh, friendly cities of Detroit and Atlanta, because it really helped contextualize what's happening into Newark, um, in Newark. And especially thanks to um, the mayor of Newark, Raj J. Baraka, for his time at the top of the morning. Um, and so with that, uh, Prudential, I'll close by saying Prudential is so deeply invested and committed to this work. And we'll use uh, today's session to really help inform our practices and how we continue to be additive to the housing ecosystem in Newark. Um, so again, thank you so very much. And I will pass it over to Yannicka to uh, close out our program today. Thank you, Tiffany. I don't know what I'd, I'd really add, but I do you know, recognize in your remarks, um, some optimism in the sense that it really does take all of these different pieces working together. Um, and so we appreciate again, Prudential's commitment. Um, 
And I want to use Vanessa's word for, for distinguished panel we just had. And in fact, all our, our presenters throughout the day, they took us on a journey from Newark, New Jersey, to Atlanta, to Detroit, to Baltimore, and then to DC for a look at the national policy landscape and some, some national trends. Um, we looked at historical rates uh, or roots of the home ownership gap, um, looked at current barriers, and we heard, we caught a glimpse, I think, of what it will take uh, to have a more racially equitable future. I promise Katim that we will get this recording out there, and I hope that you will all uh, share with us in getting out the wisdom and the insights that we all gained today. And I also want to especially thank um, both our brilliant moderators and the amazing audience. I just thought the questions today were, uh, were also extremely valuable and, and give us a lot to chew on. So thank you all very much for your time and for joining the Urban Institute today. Thank <laughs> you.